so it's been a minute since I've talked about Big Loser Japan on this channel. I've been preoccupied with other things such as dinosaurs, giant turtles, and giant dudes in wetsuits. But now I'm ready to talk about Godzilla again and bring you guys something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. My own personal Godzilla Beginner's Guide. Recently, I got the perfect opportunity to make this video when a friend of mine asked me what Godzilla movies I think are quote unquote the essentials. I updated the criteria just a little bit for this video, but in general, the principle is still the same. These are the films that I think are probably the best beginner's guide for someone who wants a small taste of the Godzilla series. Now, what exactly is the criteria that I've come up with? The first one is that these films are going to be ones that are pretty easy to find, whether that be on streaming services or on home video. Out of all the films I talk about in this video, only one of them you're actually going to have to look for on different websites. I should also mention that this isn't a ranked list. These are my top 10 favorite movies, though there are plenty of movies here that are in my top 10, but primarily these are movies I think are great for beginners, and each of them is one that I think brings something different to the table that gives everyone a small taste of the franchise, whether that be a great characters, great spectacle, or an iconic monster. There's a little bit of everything in here that I think makes the series great. Finally, I should mention a couple of films that aren't going to be on this list. Those ones are the original 1954 film, Shin Godzilla, and the American Monsterverse films. The reason that these ones are omitted is that these are kind of the obvious ones. Both 1954 and Shin are critically acclaimed films that everyone has talked about. These are the best ones, and if there is any sort of true essential viewing for Godzilla, it would probably be these two. As for the Monsterverse films, these are ones I think most people have seen already, but if you haven't seen them, I would also recommend them as a sort of streamlined introduction to the general mythos. So consider these films just a couple of the honorable mentions. We'll get to the rest later, don't worry. So with all the pieces set into place, let's finally dive right on into the Sam the Gagan Fan Godzilla Beginner's Guide. First up, we got Mothra vs. Godzilla from 1964, appropriately enough the first Godzilla movie that I ever saw. There are a few reasons why this one is on the list. The first one is its message. This is one of the many films in the series to use the message of collaboration and working together to overcome a common enemy. The enemy, of course, being Godzilla. And in my opinion, this is probably the film that does it the best. The situation that our characters are forced into is really quite dire, with Godzilla rampaging across Japan with seemingly no way to stop him. They have to figure out a way to convince Mothra's people in order to let Mothra help them out during this time of conflict. And it's all super compelling, and the resolution to this arc is really genuine and sincere. It doesn't come off as forced, it's much more honest and vulnerable, and I really appreciate that. This isn't a film that has a human story out of obligation, it genuinely has something to say with its characters and has a real idea to push. Another thing I really love about this film is its music. I think the music in all of the films on this list is really great, but this film in particular has truly fantastic music. The score for this film was done by Akira Ifukube, who is easily the most iconic composer for the Godzilla series. This is the guy who brought the ever iconic Godzilla theme to life, and this is probably my favorite score that he's done. This film's version of the Godzilla theme in particular is my favorite version that he's ever done. And then, of course, you have the Mothra Twin songs. Of course, you have the ever-iconic Mothra song, which instead of being this much more lively, upbeat, and triumphant tune, is replaced with a much more somber version that is up there for my favorite version of the song. And then, of course, you have Sacred Springs, which is by far the film's best song. Once again, another somber but also quite beautiful piece, which is only elevated by the vocals of Yumi and Emi Ito, also known as the Peanuts. The music here is just so incredibly good. And last but certainly not least, you have the introduction of one of the Godzilla series' most iconic monsters in the form of Mothra. This isn't the very first film that Mothra appeared in. She had her own solo film back in 1961, but this is her first proper appearance in the Godzilla series, and in my opinion, this is one of her best incarnations. An aged goddess on the brink of death, but will still do everything she can to defend the ones that she loves with an insane amount of tenacity. The fight that she has with Godzilla is one of my favorite fights in the entire series, one that's charged with so much emotion, and even with the occasional puppet interlude, it is still genuinely exciting and has you on the edge of your seat. If nothing else, Mothra vs. Godzilla absolutely brings to the table some of the series' best attributes, giving us a truly great human story, some wonderful music, and a fantastic introduction to one of the Godzilla series' most iconic BCs. It's one that I watched a ton when I was younger, and I would be remiss if I didn't put it on this list. 
Up next, we got ourselves a tie. Don't worry, this is the only one that's going to be in this video. The films in question are 1964's Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster and 1965's Invasion of Astro Monster, or as many prefer to call it, Monster Zero. Now, the main reason that I'm picking both of these mainly just comes down to personal preference and what you really want in your movie. If you want something with more monster action, then go for Ghidorah. If you want something that has a lot more character and dramatic elements, pick Monster Zero. But ultimately, both of these films have a similar reason for being picked. Just like Mothra vs. Godzilla, both of these films act as introductions for two other iconic monsters in the Godzilla series. The first one I want to bring up is Rodan. Much like Mothra, Rodan is a flying monster who can create strong winds using his wings and also pretty frequently has battles with Godzilla. However, the one big thing that separates him from Mothra is that Rodan is a little shithead. He and Godzilla do not get along. Most of Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster is these two bickering with each other and Mothra trying to convince them to team up against the titular Three-Headed Monster. However, when push comes to shove, Rodan will usually team up with the good monsters in order to help them win the fight. Secondly, and arguably more importantly, we have King Ghidorah, the Joker to Godzilla's Batman, his arch nemesis. Ghidorah is specifically bespoken for as the villain of Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster being made as the final boss in which Godzilla, Rodan, and Mothra have to team up against. And that's usually the role he takes as the series goes on. Once you see this big shitter show up, you know it's about to get serious. Get ready kiddos, this is the boss fight. I'd say that Ghidorah has some of his coolest appearances in these two films. The dude is beautifully brought to life thanks to the special effects team led by special effects wizard Eiji Tsuburaya. His bell-like cackle and flying noises are iconic, and his very striking design which is inspired by numerous creatures ranging from the Yamada no Orochi to the Unicorn. King Ghidorah is absolutely one of the great Godzilla villains for a reason, and these films definitely bring him to life in truly fantastic ways. Another thing I want to bring up are the human stories and monster antics here. They're both really good. As I said, it comes down to personal preference on whether or not you'd prefer more human drama or more monster action, but really, I don't think you'd be losing anything if you choose one or the other. Both of these films have equally great human scenes and monster antics. In Ghidorah, I've already mentioned the hijinks between Godzilla and Rodan, but the human story also revolves around a princess who has been possessed by a Venetian making her way to Earth in order to warn Earth's people of the impending destruction of their planet. All the while, you have assassins trying to kill the princess and a brother and sister duo trying to protect the princess in their own different ways, and the end result is very entertaining. Meanwhile, Monster Zero deals with two astronauts visiting a far off planet behind Jupiter, only to encounter an alien race who wishes to use Godzilla and Rodan to get rid of King Ghidorah. Along with them, you also have a quirky inventor, his girlfriend, and a mysterious femme fatale who might be hiding something from the rest of the cast. While there isn't nearly as much monster action in here as its predecessor, in fact, this film is the one with the least amount of Godzilla screen time, but you don't really care about that because the human plotline is just that engaging. When the monster action is here, it's still really fun, with Godzilla, Rodan, and Ghidorah not only getting a couple of good skirmishes in here, but also lots of great city destruction scenes, stock footage notwithstanding. Also, one more thing that I should mention before I move on. Well, I think you could get a pretty good experience watching the original Japanese cuts of these ones. I personally much prefer their respective American cuts. Ghidorah has much better pacing in the American cut, being re-edited so that certain scenes flow much more naturally with each other. As for Monster Zero, you would severely be missing out on the performance of resident American actor Nick Adams, who delivers one hell of a fantastic performance, with numerous memorable lines spread all throughout. You rats. You stinking rats! What did you do her? Fortunately, the American cut of Monster Zero is very easy to find. It's the version that's available on HBO Max as well as other streaming services. Ghidorah you're gonna have to find on other websites such as Internet Archive, but you can find it fairly easy. Both of these films are absolutely great times, introducing some absolutely iconic monsters as well as some great human stories, and they've certainly earned their place on this list. So you know how I said that the last picks were gonna be the only tie in this video? Anyways, up next we got 1974's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla and 1975's Terror of Mechagodzilla. I chose both of these films for a couple of reasons. The first one is basically the same reason why I chose both Ghidorah and Monster Zero for a shared spot. Much like Ghidorah, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla much more heavily leans into its monster action, while Terror of Mechagodzilla leans much more into the story and character drama. So once again, it depends on what you want from your monster movies. So if I picked these movies for basically the same reasons as the last ones, why did I even put them here in the first place? Well, there's two reasons. The first one I want to bring up is that once again, another iconic member of the Godzilla monster roster is introduced, which, of course, is the magnificent machine Mechagodzilla. Mechagodzilla is a character who, unlike previously mentioned monsters, 
has had numerous different interpretations and roles to play in the series. But this original incarnation of Mechagodzilla is my personal favorite. A stone cold alien war machine made with the sole purpose of killing Godzilla and being armed to the teeth with all sorts of crazy weapons. Eye lasers, chest lasers, finger missiles, toe missiles. Mechagodzilla pretty much has everything you can think of. And you certainly bet that the special effects team let loose with having him use his entire artillery in plenty of seriously awesome destruction scenes. Mechagodzilla in a lot of ways is like the new King Ghidorah at this time in the series, with Godzilla having to team up with another monster in order to take him down, this time being the Okinawan god King Caesar. However, unlike Ghidorah, Mechagodzilla's second movie has the villain gain a brand new ally, this time being the aquatic dinosaur Titanosaurus. It certainly makes the final battle with Godzilla in Terror of Mechagodzilla a whole lot more intense considering that this is one of the first times that Godzilla has been outnumbered with a really solid chance of losing. The second reason why I chose these films is that I think they're the perfect encapsulation of everything that this Godzilla series, the Showa series, is all about, at least by the end of it. By this time, Godzilla had become a savior of the earth, thwarting off alien invasions and whatever devilish beasties that they would have brought along with them. And you get to see that in full display here. Godzilla really goes all in when it comes to trying to stop Mechagodzilla in these movies, and he certainly gets put through the ringer. What did that be being in the midst of one of Mechagodzilla's never-ending barrage of weapons to turning into a bread sprinkler and even getting buried alive? This is Godzilla in full-blown 70s superhero mode, and it is awesome to see, and something that is really only exclusive to these 70s films, as later on Godzilla would fall more into the villain slash anti-hero role. Another big thing in these 70s films is the constant alien invasions. Alien invasions were something that have been around for quite a while at this point. Hell, we even talked about some of them already. But the 70s films really went hard with this idea. Whether it be an alien race utilizing monsters to destroy the Earth, or some random monster from space that's trying to destroy the Earth. All of these films in some way deal with some kind of alien invasion, and the two Mechagodzilla films are no exception to that rule. The alien races are really fun too, with them being especially hammy and cheesy in the best kind of way, especially in these films as dubs. The stories and characters in both of these are really fun too, with the first film having a plot that features ancient Okinawan prophecies, a spy plotline, and of course an alien invasion, while Terror of Mechagodzilla is a lot slower and more serious in tone, dealing with the story of a mad scientist and his daughter who are forced to work with the aliens for very personal and dramatic reasons. And both are very enjoyable, though if I had to pick what human story is better, I would say the points go in Terror of Mechagodzilla's favor. But overall though, I think both of these films are very fun, being the quintessential Showa era Godzilla films, and I think are more than worthy of being on this list. Coming up next, we're jumping ahead over 15 years later for 1989's Godzilla vs. Biollante, the second film from the second series, known as the Heisei or Versus series. Now this one I have picked out for a few reasons. Much like Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, I think that Godzilla vs. Biollante is a perfect encapsulation of the best elements of the Heisei series. This is the era that brought Godzilla back to his roots as a destructive force of nature, and the plots of these films mostly center around figuring out new ways to defeat him. Also, a lot of the monsters in these films are related to Godzilla somehow. Whether it be directly, and methods such as direct clones, or blood relations, or creatures created in his image, or unrelated, such as weapons that are used to fight against Godzilla, or monsters that are born from weapons that killed Godzilla's of the past. Even returning monsters like Ghidorah and Rodan have origins and backstories that are related to Godzilla somehow. However, I think that out of all these films, Biollante does these elements in the most interesting and fun ways. First and foremost, the military plot of trying to take Godzilla down. This is personally where I think the movie is at its strongest. You have so many different elements coming together and somehow they all work well with each other and don't feel cramped or forced. You have the production of these types of bacteria that are capable of consuming nuclear energy and that are the ace in the hole when it comes to properly defeating Godzilla, as well as an aerial combat vehicle called the Super X-2 that can reflect Godzilla's signature atomic breath back at him. Both of these things are legitimately really cool and fun additions that make this movie much more exciting by bringing all sorts of interesting strategizing and combat scenes. I really like the characters in the side of the plot too. The new major trying to prove himself as a really compelling character journey of trying to gain the respect of everyone around him. His right hand man Gondo is a badass and easily the coolest character in the movie. And then you got the Serradian agent, who is probably the funniest character in any Godzilla movie. Dude just shows up, kills a guy, and then exits stage right. That's it! That's his character! 
and it's great! As for a lot of the military scenes, they're all really fun too. Military engagements are a huge staple of the Godzilla series. Seeing a barrage of tanks and planes and helicopters take on Godzilla is really fun, especially when it's done really well, such as in this film. Of course, I've already mentioned the Super X2 and its fights with Godzilla, but you also have other fun engagements, such as the operation to actually get the bacteria into Godzilla, and the operation in the climax evolving artificial lightning. It's all great stuff. The other half of the plot features the film's other title monster, Biollante. And I think Biollante is pretty neat. This Rose Godzilla human hybrid monster is honestly where I think a lot of the film's heart and soul lies, mainly due to the human connections that she has. The most obvious of which being her creator, Dr. Shiragami, who created her out of grief after losing his daughter and wanting to create a plant that could live forever, unintentionally bringing to life this truly unique and awe-inspiring monster. Along for the ride on this other half of the story include Miki Sigusa, a girl with telepathic abilities, as well as her mentor Asuka and Asuka's boyfriend Kirishima who helps out with the Bacteria Project. You got yourself some really memorable characters in this cast. I like everyone here quite a bit. Lastly, the final reason I want to recommend this movie to newcomers is the design of Godzilla himself. This design, the Heisei era design, is arguably the definitive design of Godzilla. It's the one that's plastered all over official media to this day, and it is also the design that is easily the most represented in merchandise. And this is where it's made its grand debut, and in my opinion, this is the film in which the suit looks its best. The Biogoji suit, as fans call it, it's just a really damn good looking suit. Brought to life by two different suits used for both water and land scenes, but also animatronics that are very expressive and have a great range of movement. This is the most iconic Godzilla design of all time, and this movie is where it got its start. There are plenty of other reasons to recommend this movie as a solid starting point, such as its very impressive effects and miniature work, and of course, I cannot talk about this movie without bringing up the ever iconic Sweet 7 Bio Wars. The only real unfortunate thing is that this movie is the only one that is not readily available on home video, so you're gonna have to purchase a DVD copy on sites like eBay for anywhere from 20 to 40 bucks. But there are also copies on sites such as archive.org if you really want to see it. Overall though, this is a very fun film that should be great for any beginner to the Godzilla series. Up next, we're skipping ahead another decade to my personal favorite Godzilla movie, 1999's Godzilla 2000, the first installment of Godzilla's third series, the Millennium Series. I don't want to go too in-depth for this one because I want to make a full video talking about why I love it so much, but the best way to describe Godzilla 2000 is that it is the Godzilla movie of all time, and I mean that in the best possible way. It's basically like you took everything that makes the Godzilla series so good, threw it in a blender, and you get Godzilla 2000. And good lord is it great. If there was one movie from this list I'd say is the perfect starting point, this is it. You've got one of the best human stories in the entire Godzilla series with lots of great characters. For the good guys, you've got Shinoda and his daughter Io, who are both a part of the Godzilla Prediction Network, an organization that tracks and studies Godzilla in hopes of finding some sort of scientific breakthrough, as well as Yuki, a woman working for a newspaper company who joins Shinoda and Io on their Godzilla tracking shenanigans. For the bad guys, you have Katagiri, the leader of the Crisis Control Intelligence, an organization dedicated to the exterminator of Godzilla, and who is also a professional asshole, and Miyasaka, Katagiri's right-hand man and also an old friend of Shinoda's. I love this human story so much primarily because of the whole dilemma that the characters are put through. Shinoda wants to keep Godzilla alive and Katagiri wants him gone. You both clearly understand where these characters are coming from and you can very easily see both sides of their arguments. With Shinoda believing in the potential scientific breakthroughs Godzilla holds are too great to have him destroyed, but also recognizing how dangerous he is, and Katagiri wanting him destroyed for the safety of everyone in Japan and believes that keeping him alive is too much of a risk. Of course, the film picks the side of the good guys, but it's really engaging to see these characters talk about their ideals and morals. Another thing I really love about this film is its alien invasion plot. Yeah, we've gotten yet another alien invasion story, and this one might honestly be my favorite. It's pretty much a combination of all previous Godzilla alien invasions, having a sentient alien force lead the charge while still only being a singular entity. I also love how the alien invasion isn't just, let this guy kick Godzilla's ass! Instead, 
said, it's much more simple. In which they try to gain more and more data about the Earth and Godzilla through Earth's technology, and can you tell that this film came out during the Y2K scare? It's way more simple, but also a really damn effective way at setting up an intimidating alien force. The final battle that the UFO also has with Godzilla is really fun. I don't want to spoil it, but if you've seen Nope, then you know how this is gonna go. Also, there is one more thing that I should mention here before I move on. Remember how I said that with Monster Zero and Ghidorah, you should preferably watch those in their English dub versions? Yeah, the same applies with Godzilla 2000. It's generally agreed upon that that version of the movie is the far superior one. The story goes that after the release of the highly controversial 1998 American Godzilla, Toho very quickly rushed this one out the following year, and because of that, lots of sound effects and music were just seemingly absent from the final cut of the film. The American cut fixes the sounds and music by updating the sound effects for both the UFO and adding sound effects from the 1998 Godzilla, as well as adding some new musical cues that just work wonders. There is a track that shows up during the final battle that I just adore. It's also got some pretty solid lines in the dub itself, my personal favorite being the ever iconic, I guarantee it'll go through Godzilla like crap through a goose. So yeah, if there's any version of the movie that I'd recommend, it would be this one. But overall though, Godzilla 2000 is an absolute gem and my personal favorite the entire series. Absolutely one I would recommend for anyone to check out as their first Godzilla film. And finally, the last film that we are going to be taking a look at in this video is 2002's Godzilla Against Mechagodzilla, my birth year Godzilla movie. We've got the glorious return of Mechagodzilla in this one. This time, however, he's taken on a completely different role. Remember when I said that Mechagodzilla has had numerous different interpretations over the years? Well, here he is in his most definitive different role in the classic Godzilla films. Instead of being an alien war machine destined to conquer Earth, this time he's now the protector of Japan, fighting against Godzilla. Now, this isn't exactly anything new for the character. His previous appearance in 1993's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 had him take on a very similar role, but this film is his best reinterpretation in my opinion. Also what makes him stand out from the other ones is that this one is technically a cyborg. Utilizing the skeleton of the original 1954 Godzilla as a base, in which the scientists of the movie built around in order to fully recreate Mechagodzilla, as well as use some of the original Godzilla's DNA to act as a computer to help run the Metallic Colossus. Mechagodzilla in this movie also has a truly fantastic design, and is one of my favorite looks for the character. While I like the old-fashioned vintage look of the original Mechagodzilla, the sleek and shiny look of the Millennium Mechagodzilla is super eye-catching and definitely one of the most beloved designs of the character. On the topic of looks, this is also one of the best looking Godzilla films when it comes to its effects work. The miniatures in this one are top-notch, with the final battle in Shinagawa Ward being one of the coolest Godzilla final fights. Also just being one of the most well-choreographed too, with Godzilla and Mechagodzilla really going all out on each other. But of course, these fights wouldn't be anything without a great human story backing it up. And thankfully, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla has what many would consider to be one of the best human stories in the entire series, myself included. There are a lot of really strong and likable characters here, including Dr. Yuhara, one of the head scientists working on Mechagodzilla, and Sarah, his daughter who is currently working through the loss of her mother. Though the standout is, of course, Akane Yashiro, the film's main character. She has a really great character arc. Akane is one of many in a long line of a common trope in monster movies, in which a person or people related to the main character is killed by a monster, and that character has to overcome and work through that trauma that they've been dealt with, and in my opinion, this film is one of the best versions of that story. Akane starts the film off by not having a lot of value in herself after an accident that killed a few of her teammates, but only by learning the love and respect of the others around her is she finally able to pull through and finish the fight with Godzilla. It's a really simple and effective story that works wonders. The story is the main reason why that final fight between Godzilla and Mechagodzilla has so much weight and emotion behind it, and that's what makes the final fight one of the best in the entire series. If there was a good way to describe Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, I'd say that it's easily the most mainstream of the classic Godzilla films. I feel like that you could show this film to anyone and they would probably like it a lot. And hey, by all means, if you really like this one, then you should also check out its direct sequel, Godzilla Tokyo SOS. It's weaker in the human plot, but the effect sequences are more than worth the price of a mission, and it also features the return of Mothra in what might be her best looking appearance in any of the classic Godzilla films. As for Godzilla against Mechagodzilla though, it's a very simple yet effective film, with a great Mechagodzilla redesign, great effect sequences, and a fantastic human story. That coupled with a fantastic score and great performances really make this one of the best films in the entire series. I go as far and say that it's easily my favorite Mechagodzilla film, and I wholeheartedly believe that it has earned its spot on this list. 
And that's it, we're done. We've completed the Godzilla Beginner's Guide. So be sure to go and check out some or all the movies mentioned here if any of them caught your interest and come back here to comment on whether or not you liked or disliked any of the choices I made for this list. Wait, Sam, what if I wanted to check out more movies after I've seen this list? Do you have a list of any more I could watch? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. I've made an entire list of films on Letterboxd that I think you should go and check out. These include the ones I've already mentioned in this video as well as others that I think you should check out afterwards. I've given reasons as to why I think you should watch these movies too. So if any of these sound appealing, then go right on ahead and check it out with the link in the description below. But of course, these are just my thoughts and I want to know yours. If you're a Godzilla fan, what did you think of my selections? And what are some films that you would have on your personal Godzilla Beginner's Guide? Be sure to sound off those thoughts and more in the comments section down below, and be sure to follow me on my social medias and join my Discord server if you want updates on upcoming videos or you just want to hear my goofy rants about giant monster stuff. And if you liked what you saw and want to see more, then be sure to hit that subscribe button. Either way, I'm Sam the Gigan fan, hoping that you all enjoy my Godzilla Beginner's Guide and telling you all to wash your hands.